Welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free, formerly Wannabe Minimalist, the podcast for busy families who are tired of the chaos, fed up with being overwhelmed, and ready to enjoy life again. Each week, we talk about how to let go of the clutter so that you can focus on the things that actually matter. And it's not just physical clutter. We talk about the mental and emotional stuff too, because if it's holding you back, it's time to ditch it. I share what I've done in my own life to declutter, organize, and calm the chaos, but you won't just hear it from me. There are amazing guests too. It's practical, doable, and simple for those of us that want to be clutter-free. You're listening to The Wannabe Minimalist Show with Deanna Yates, episode number 92. On today's episode, I'm talking about the three most common mistakes people make when they are decluttering. If you've struggled to declutter in the past, it just might be these three things that are holding you back. All right, let's do this. Hey there, friend. Welcome back to the show. The other day, I was talking with a friend of mine, and she was telling me about her attempts at decluttering. Now, everyone in my life knows I love a good declutter session. So when they have questions with what to do with their stuff or issues getting rid of something, they generally make their way to me. Well, she told me that she has tried to declutter in the past, but she's basically given up on this, you know, at this point, because every time she has tried to keep her space neat, it would be messy again within a week or a month tops. And she told me that her husband's not really on board and her mom buys her kids like anything they want whenever they want, even though she has asked her mom countless times to stop, you know, so I know I hear these stories a lot. And so I just took a minute and I asked her if her stuff was in order. I don't, you know, let's just take a moment. Let's focus on what we can. And I, I just wanted to ask her, how, how are your things? Well, you can probably guess her answer because it's the answer a lot of us give. This is, this is life. This is what I hear all the time. It was something like, "Mm, well, not really. You know, she didn't see the point when she felt all alone. She felt like it was a never ending battle. And so she had kind of just thrown in the towel. She put up the white flag. But there's just so much to do. You know, she felt like she just had so much to do and she failed before she even started. Does that sound familiar at all? It's okay if it does, because today I am going to give some advice that I gave to her. I'm going to share it with you today on how to work on her stuff. Because as we were talking, I realized that she was making the same mistakes that I see over and over. And if she was making those mistakes, then it's likely you are too. So it's okay. We're going to do something about it. So stay tuned. But before we jump in, I want to remind you that you can pick up the show notes for today's episode on my website, wannabeclutterfree.com slash 92. Now there you will find any links I discussed today and access to all of my resources, courses, and free guides. So make sure you head to wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 92 to check out the links for today's topic and get any free guides and things that I have there. Okay, it's wannabeclutterfree.com slash 92. I think we got it. All right, with that, let's look at the three biggest decluttering mistakes that I see and how to fix them. Okay, mistake number one is thinking that organizing and decluttering are the same thing. I cannot tell you how many times I hear people say they want to get organized. And when they say organized, they mean that they want to get those pretty Instagram you know, shots, right? They want the pretty Instagram closet, the pantry, the kitchen, all of that stuff. Well, what they don't mean when they say they want to get organized in, and get those results is they don't say they want to go through their stuff and declutter, discard, and donate the things that they don't want. Look, we all want the easy path. I get it. It's just how we are. Life is busy enough, and we don't want to make the time to go through our past. That's what our stuff is. It's a reminder of our past, things we've done, the life we have led up to this point. It is hard work. And it's really hard to hold up a shirt you bought from a concert, you know, for a band that you used to love, or to cull a collection of things that you have, you know, picked up along the way through your travels or through your childhood, something like that. Maybe some of your stuff brings up bad memories of a lost love or awkward times or things you're just not proud of. Maybe you love some of the things you have, but they no longer fit with your current lifestyle or the life you envision for yourself. That is why this is hard. But here's the truth. You cannot organize your clutter. 
Clutter is stuff you do not need. It adds weight to your life and it adds to the overwhelm and it just makes life harder. So instead, we're going to move past this mistake and you have to separate those two words and you have to look at them for the different actions that they are and the different times that they are necessary. So decluttering has to come first. It just has to. Decluttering is being honest and open about your life, about where you are, about what you have done, and letting go of those items that are now at this moment in time unnecessary, unused, or unloved. When you declutter, there will be less stuff to keep clean, less stuff to tidy up at the end of the day, and definitely less of that stuff that makes you feel bad about yourself. Let me tell you this right now in case you need to hear it. The items in your home, they're just things. Most are absolutely replaceable, so you shouldn't fuss too much over letting something go. But the things that you absolutely need to declutter from your life are any items that bring up negative emotions for you. You do not need that in your life. Let that crud go and open up your life to more positive experiences and emotions. Now, it might sound a little woo-woo or spiritual, but things hold energy, even if it's just the energy that you associate with the item. And when you look at these things or hold them, that energy affects you. Why would you hold on to something that makes you feel bad? If it's something you need, for example, let's say you went through a divorce and the glasses that you have in your kitchen remind you of your ex. Well, toss them out and replace them with new glasses that you love. It's a small investment in your daily happiness, but these little things add up over time. They compound on top of each other. And we need to make sure that we are positive so that we can live this life that we really want to be living instead of being dragged down into the doldrums. And if money is tight, then make a list of the necessities that you need to replace and then start replacing them over time. Again, we don't have to do everything overnight, but we need to make a plan to go where we want to go and to be the person we want to be and to do the things that we want in life. If we don't make the plan, we will not get there. Somebody else will make the plan for you and you will follow someone else's path or someone else's idea of what your life should be like. We are in control. So when you are ready to declutter, there are a few different approaches you can take. You can make the piles of things to keep, donate, discard, and maybe even a pile for those things that you're on the fence about. And I do actually call that the maybe pile. So that you can do that one. That's the pile method. I've done that before. Or you can have a packing party where you pretend that you're moving. Now, with this approach, you pack up everything that you own, and then you only retrieve the items from the boxes when you need them, right? Only the things that you actually need come out of the boxes. You don't unpack when you you pack it all up, and then you leave it there until you need it, okay? Now, after a couple weeks or maybe a couple months, the idea is that you will stop going to those boxes because you will have everything that you need and then you can donate what's already packed up. That part makes it a little bit easier. Now, the third option is to declutter one space at a time. You would use a black garbage bag to put any items that you're discarding and you'd put your donations in a box and then you'd put away anything that you want to keep. So as you're going through a space, if you find something you want to keep, you go ahead and give it a home right then. You put it away where you want to keep it. And now this way, you're able to clean up much quicker. I mean, the process itself takes longer, but then if you get interrupted or, you know, something happens, you, it's easy to stop. So you can just clean up at the end of each decluttering session and then that makes it a little bit easier. Now I have a few previous episodes on decluttering approaches, so I will make sure that I link them in the show notes, but these are the three most popular. Okay, so now that we understand decluttering and what it entails, let's talk about organization. I know it can be super tempting to want to drive to Target or the container store and get all new matching baskets or bins or, you know, all those shiny new containers, right? That is definitely what we all think of when we think of organizing or when we think of the end product that we want. Because after all, if you can just put the things that you own in these bins, it will look good, right? Well, I wish it were that easy. If you don't get rid of the things that you don't need, use, or love, so if you did not follow step number one into clutter, then you will just be organizing clutter, and that makes the system hard to maintain. 
So remember how my friend said that she tried to keep her space neat, but it would be messy again in a week or a month at most? Well, that's because she was trying to organize clutter. There was too much stuff that she wasn't using, so it became too hard to find the things she did want or to tidy up at the end of the day or to tidy up the space when she was done with it because there was just too much stuff. And so it just became overwhelming. She stopped following the system. She stopped using the organizing methods. And then, hence, we got back into the mess, right? So this is why organizing must, absolutely must come after decluttering. Organizing is when you create a simple system to neatly contain the items that you need, use, and love, not clutter or things that you might need someday. Again, things that you actually need, actually use, and really love. So when you have less, it becomes easier to maintain and to not go back to that messy house a week after you organize it. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. (laughs) Well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, so mistake number one is not knowing the difference between organizing and decluttering and trying to do the wrong one first. Mistake number two is blaming someone else for your clutter issues. Boy, this one is a big one. I know it is so hard when you have a vision for what you want and you feel like no one else is on board or supporting you. Yes, that is hard, but it doesn't mean that your vision is any less important. We need to just take a moment and realize that it is our vision and we have to be willing to live it in order to get other people on board. So back to my friend and I was telling you how she said her husband was not on board and her mom keeps buying her kids things even though she has asked her to stop, right? Yes, that second part, it's really obnoxious, but there are ways to make some adjustments. So she could ask her mom to keep the new items at her home. Or she could tell her kids that each time they get a new thing from grandma, they're going to have to decide which item in their home it will replace. Because if they really are running out of room, then it's going to become a little obvious and the kids are going to notice and they're going to be, you know, as long as you set the boundaries, it's your home. So you get to decide what actually gets to stay in it or how much space they have to keep their stuff. If it's overflowing out of their room and into your living room and taking over the whole house, well, you have control to take that back. It is your house, okay? So that is one way that you can approach, actually a couple ways you can approach if grandma is overbuying. However, I wanna dig a little bit deeper on this. If your family is not on board, I have always found that when I lead by example, people are more likely to follow what I do, right? Like I can't, I have to actually give action to my words. I can't just give lip service. I have to actually do it in order for people to follow along. So I talk about this all the time. I I preach it from the rooftops because I am a wholehearted believer in this. And I actually received an email from a listener a few weeks ago. She was decluttering her craft supplies. And this was a big area for her as the supplies had been used for an Etsy business that she had actually had to shut down. Now, she told me there was a lot of stuff and a good chunk of it came with big emotional ties for her. The thing is, her eight-year-old daughter saw her decluttering the space. She asked her about it. She knew that this was tough for her mom. She, her mom was planning to give some of those supplies to a local uh, low-income retirement home so that the residents could use them. It was this wonderful thing. She shared this moment with her daughter and her daughter nodded and then wandered away. Now she thought she was just going to go off and play, but about 30 minutes later, her daughter came back with an armload of puzzles that she wanted to donate to. Now, this woman tells me that she had never gone through any of her daughter's stuff. They'd never decluttered together. They'd never done any of that. Her daughter just did what she saw her mom doing. She was following 
her lead. And the daughter was so excited to share her things with others. Now, as this listener told me, she said her mind was blown. She couldn't believe that she just picked up and did what her mom was doing. You guys, our kids follow what we do. We set the example and we are the ones that they look to for guidance. So if we're not willing to deal with our own stuff first, how can we expect them to deal with their stuff? So this is the power of leading by example. Sometimes people around us just need to know that we are serious before they invest the time and effort themselves. When we prove that we are willing to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, we inspire others to get on board with our visions and our dreams and come along on that journey with us, right? We're not dictators. We're not controlling people. We're not pulling the, you know, the strings. This is a change that we want to make because we are passionate about it. And once that passion is shown and you people see it with the follow through, gosh, they are on board. I have seen this work time and time and time again. So if this is where you struggle, I want you to give it a try. I want you to lead by example and I want you to declutter your stuff first. Bring your family along. Make sure they see you do it. Tell them what you're doing. Talk about where you're going to donate your stuff. Put on fashion shows and help them. You have them help you declutter your closet. You know, honestly, this will show them that you are serious. And worst case, even if they don't get on board, you are going to reap the benefits because you will have less stuff holding you back. So you will feel lighter and you will feel better and you will know that you did what you wanted and you are fulfilling your vision because either way, it's a win, right? If it works and they want to come on board with you, fantastic. Then it will be a ripple effect through the community, through your family, which will lead out into the community. And if they don't, well, you at least will feel better. Trust me, it is amazing to get your stuff in order and it will eventually pay off. Okay, so that's mistake number two is blaming someone else for your clutter issues. And it really stems when you don't look to yourself first. And that brings us to mistake number three, which is trying to do it all at once. Now, we have all been here. We watch an episode of Tidying Up with Marie Kondo or Getting Organized with the Home Edit on Netflix. Or worse, we watch an episode of Hoarders and we get this wild hair that we need to make drastic changes in our homes and lives and they have to happen right now. I don't think I'm the only person that's done that, right? So we go all KonMari and we start with our clothes. We drag everything out of our closets. We finish up a load of laundry and we add that to the pile. And then we run around and we pull out every coat, hat, scarf that we own. We put that on the pile too. And when all is said and done, we have Mount Clothing to climb and to conquer. And it's all on our bed. Well, you better get climbing because until you get to the bottom of that mountain, you will not have anywhere to sleep tonight. Here's the problem with this approach. And I can speak to this candidly because this actually happened to me. So when I was first on my journey toward minimalism, I did this and I failed miserably. I started off with energy and excitement and I was soon worn out. It took longer to gather the clothes than I had liked. And I was pretty grumpy when I got to the end of that pile. I was over it. Like I just, ugh, I was not a happy person. I was not someone you wanted to be around. And my husband was also grumpy because it was his bed too. And he wanted to go to sleep. And it meant that he couldn't sleep until I had finished, right? Well, I just thank my lucky stars that I did this before I became a parent because a child needing my attention throughout the day would have made that process, oh my gosh, so much longer, so much more draining, so much more stressful. And I just, ugh. I can imagine that it would have just ended up with mount clothing on my floor and, you know, just kind of thrown in the towel, right? Well, it, yeah, it was not, it was not my fin- finest moment. I will say that. So please remember that all of the stuff that is in your house didn't get there overnight. It's been collecting for a lifetime. So it's going to take us a little bit to unravel it. It's not going to take us a lifetime but we're not going to be able to just rip off the Band-Aid and have it fixed tomorrow. We're we're not, we're just not going to do that. We're not in college anymore. Our stuff doesn't fit in the bed of a truck. And so it's just going to take us a little bit and that's okay. So just, we need to go into it with a little bit of perspective so that we know that we can't do it all. We cannot do everything. We cannot do it all at once. For some of you listening to this, that is really bad news. 
Now that you know what you want, you want that neat, tiny, uncluttered house. You know, you know you want that and you want it done yesterday. For some of you listening, this part might sound actually like a breath of fresh air. You have time to process your things and not get stuck with a pile of stuff to deal with. What I always recommend is to start with smaller goals. Declutter your desk work surface. Declutter your makeup bag. Declutter the utensil drawer. Get some quick wins under your belt and it will be easier to keep going. So this is the best way to keep that overwhelm away. So instead of letting your train of thought get away from you and allowing the idea of decluttering to go from, okay, now think about this, right? Like you're sitting there and you're saying, I want to declutter my closet. Well, then I've got to declutter my bedroom. Ugh, my nightstand. Wow, it's a mess. And this room, oh my gosh, it's such a catch-all. Oh gosh, the guest room, that's the real catch-all. What am I going to do with those boxes that we put in there last summer when we helped my mom clean out her garage? Oh my gosh. Okay. Can you see how that felt overwhelming? It is impossible to do it all at once, right? We cannot declutter our closet and our bedroom and our nightstand and the guest room all at the same time. We can't be in more places, more than one place at a time, right? So we need to just take a breath, quiet our mind, and choose one space. Choose one thing, one area, one small thing. If you finish that thing and you still have energy, well, go ahead and do another place. I'm not saying you can only do one a day. You can just do one at a time. So this will help you stay on course. It will help you declutter more I promise it sounds like I'm telling you to declutter less, but I promise you it will add up to more because I have found that over time, this approach is not only sustainable, but it makes decluttering less of a chore. And even though you declutter less at the beginning, right? You're decluttering one area instead of an entire room. You're going to stick with it, which means that you're going to declutter more overall. It's the real win. That is what we're really going for. We're going for a sustainable change. We're not going for a fad diet. We don't want to yo-yo back to a messier house. We want the end product that we can envision in our head. So that is mistake number three is trying to do it all and then not understanding that if we can just break it down into smaller chunks, we will do more over time and we will make the progress that we really want to make. And with that, I want to turn it to you. Did these three things sound familiar? Have you made these mistakes in the past? How did you fix them? Come on over to the Wannabe Minimalist Family Group on Facebook and share so others can learn from what's worked for you. I know it can be scary to share, but telling your story helps others on their path to a better life. The group is super supportive and we're there to encourage you and grow together. We can make our lives the ones we are excited to wake up for every day, and I am looking forward to cheering you along. If you would like a more behind the scenes view into my life, tips on living better with less stuff, decluttering and organizing, go ahead and follow me on Instagram at wannabe clutter free. If you like this episode or found any episode helpful, please consider leaving me a review on Apple podcast. It is the lifeblood for a podcaster and it helps me so much. Thank you for tuning in today. And if you would like to learn more from me, how I can help you or how you can implement the things we chat about on the Wannabe Minimalist Show, head over to wannabeclutterfree.com slash learn. There are free downloads, online programs, and other resources to help you create the vibrant, happy, simple, and abundant life that you really want. That just about wraps it up for today's show. Join me here next week to discuss spring cleaning tips. Spring is here. The birds are chirping. The winter doldrums are on their way out. So it is time to get a fresh start as we head into the new season. Until then, have a fabulous week. I'm Deanna Yates, and this is the Wannabe Minimalist Show. Cheers.